Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. All right, good morning. I'm glad to be here. I, I was here before uh, in 2015, so that was a little while ago. And I'm sure all of you know, uh, you remember everything that was said back then. And uh, yeah, well, you've had one of our other speakers here more recently than that. Um, uh, actually, a speaker from Australia, Dr. Mark Harwood. But um, anyways, for, I'm, I'm guessing you don't remember what was said. So <laughs> what, what I want to do this morning is talk about the creation evolution issue and do a little bit more than that and talk about the, the creation evolution issue within the con within the the kind of overarching topic of the Christian worldview. But we'll, we'll get there in a minute. Uh, for those of you who've never heard of Creation Ministries before, we have offices in seven countries around the world. I head up the Canadian office. I've been doing that for, uh, for many years. I've actually, this, this November will be 30 years that I've been speaking on this. My first presentation was in November of 1994 with a slide projector. <laughs> M remember those? Yeah. The, the, oh. And I had a red laser pointer back when red laser pointers were the newest thing. And it was to my college and career group uh, at, at my own church. And, and, and the guys came up to me and said, what is that? I said, it's a laser. And they said, like what, like on Star Wars? And I said, yeah, like I've got it in my hand. It's cool. But cool stuff. But yeah, one of the things uh, at, that make us a little bit different as a Christian ministry is we employ PhD scientists. And we work with the global community of Bible-believing scientists. You might be encouraged to know that there is one. There are Bible-believing scientists, many of them not officially associated with any, any creationist group, but they're out there doing, doing work. They believe the Bible, and they're doing science. Tens of thousands, by some estimates. A little hard to estimate that, but um, we have an information department that subscribes to all the major science publications that are out there. We keep tabs on cutting-edge science. The latest published uh, reports that are out there, the papers that are published out there, we keep tabs on that. We love science. Uh, by the way, I'm not a scientist. I work with science scientists, but my background's electronics. I went to, went, to, went to school for that, went to college for that, and worked in that for over a decade before coming on board with the ministry, but I work with scientists. And, and uh, so we, we have seven speakers in Canada. I'm not the only one. Uh, and, and we've done in our 25 plus years of ministry more than 4,000 events from coast to coast. So we've been, again, this is our third time here at Known Victory Church. So thanks for having us back. Must have done something right the last time. We also produce here in Canada a weekly half hour TV kind of a news show on creation evolution. And it, it, here's a screenshot, looks something like that. There's two guys behind a desk. And uh, actually, we shoot on a green screen. And so everything you're seeing there is, is just computer generated. Even the desk we sit at is just a plywood desk painted green. And uh, so it's all fake. That you're, and, and sometimes we wonder about the two guys behind the desk too. But no, they're real. But uh, everything else is, I mean, it would cost tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to produce a set like that and to build it physically. We can do it economically using technology. And so that's what we do. And we're on the Miracle Channel. I think they've got us on three times a week, and there's many other broadcasters around the world, uh, one, one in Canada and many in the States and elsewhere. And so we do that, and we have speakers, and we go to churches, and we, we have resources. I brought a selection with me. You probably saw them out there. We do that because we're an information ministry. That, that's, that's our role in the body of Christ. There's, there's many great Christian ministries doing wonderful work. Our role is information. We want to get faith-building information out into the church in an area where a lot of Christians struggle in their faith. And that's Genesis 1 to 11. Those, those first 11 chapters, you've got creation, the fall into sin, then the flood of Noah, the Tower of Babel about 100 years after that. And then Genesis 12, you get to Abraham, and it gets pretty normal after that. But Genesis 1 to 11, a lot of people have questions about what we read there. And that's why we have the scientists on board, because some of those questions relate to creation evolution and, and geology and physics and biology and so on. And so we have the, the scientists do, the, do the, the heavy lifting, in a sense, 
for us, for the church, to answer those kinds of questions within a Christian framework. We've got a website as well, looks something like that. Uh, there's over 15,000 articles on that website. Not 1,500, 15,000. It's a monster. It's a massive online database of faith-building information that you can go to, parents, grandparents, if your kids or grandkids are asking you questions about Genesis or creation, evolution, and science, and so on, that you don't know the answers to, that there's a search window in the upper right-hand corner. Type in whatever question you might be uh, thinking of or approached with. You know, uh, how do dinosaurs fit into the Bible? And where'd the water come from for a global flood? And was there an ice age? And what about cavemen? What about ape men? What about radiometric dating? How come we're seeing the light from galaxies that are hundreds of millions of light years away if God didn't create that long ago? And where did Cain get his wife if he wasn't able? And, uh, and other questions like that. You might have some questions like that. This is a great place to go to get answers to questions like that. Now, the website name, I apologize, is really long and hard to remember, so I thought maybe we could say this all together. It's creation.com. Ready? Creation. It's the easiest web address that you could think of if you're looking for creation information on the Internet. Create, it doesn't get any easier than that. So we have, we have speakers, we've got resources, we've got a TV show, we've got a website. And we have another tool that we have is an email news. Like every other organization under the sun, we have an email news. And in our email news, comes out every Friday morning, we give the Christian perspective on the latest scientific discoveries, what's going on in the world regarding science and so on. There's always new discoveries being made. Well, here's a new ice age theory. And, and we, we wonder as Christians, well, how do, is, do we believe in an ice age? Is that okay? Do we, how, do, how does that work? And here's a new dinosaur discovery. And it's written up as it evolved from this and it's evolving into a bird and whatever else they might be saying. And we give the Christian perspective on the latest scientific discoveries. So if that sounds interesting, there's some sign-up sheets that look like this. And if we could start those around at this point, that would be great. I'm not going to pause for that. You can circulate those among yourselves. Just put your name and email address on there. They're little tear-off forms. So fill in the lowest one and then tear it off and just hold on to it for now. And if you purchase something after the service and hand it in at the table back there, you get a free DVD. So you get a free DVD for signing up for a free email news. So there you go. Anyway, so... The topic this morning, I've kind of labeled this a Christian view of everything. There is a Christian view of everything. And we'll talk in more detail. But our, our, our main subject here this morning is the creation evolution issue. So as I started off in saying, we're, we're going to talk about creation evolution, yes. But I want to kind of step back. You've had speakers here before. I'm going to do it a little bit differently this morning. Step back and have a look at the origins debate, where, where everything came from, creation evolution in the broader context of a Christian worldview. How does that issue relate to everything else within a Christian or a biblical, let's say, worldview? And let's, let's start off with some basics here, just to get us started. There's a Christian view of the afterlife, isn't there? What is a Christian, a, there's many different views, but what is a Christian view of the afterlife? Anybody want to throw out some basics? What are some basics? Just, eternal life, yes, there is one, right? <laughs> there we go. Eternal life, yeah, so basics. We could say everybody spends eternity in one of two places, heaven or hell, right? There is a Christian view of the afterlife. There's other views as well, but there is a Christian view of the afterlife. What about a Christian view of morality, of right and wrong, good, good and evil? What are some basics of a Christian view or a biblical view of right and wrong? Ten Commandments, yes. Ten, ten, and Jesus in the New Testament summarized the ten with two, right? Love God, love your neighbor. And so, and there's many details we could add to that, of course, but there is a Christian view of morality. What about a Christian view of the meaning of life? Why are you here? I don't mean why are you here at church this morning, but <laughs> hopefully you know why you're here, but uh, yeah, to serve God. Okay, there's, the, the, we can deduce from scripture a Christian view of why we're here. Um, and, and, and that was done in a more intense way, way back in the 1640s, over in England, across the pond there, about 150 theologians got together and over many months and many meetings together after pouring over the scriptures, their conclusion is, to, to the meaning of life is, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. And we can add many details to that, of course, but there is a Christian view of these things. And we glean a Christian view of these things from 
God's word, from the scriptures. We can deduce those things from God's word. Well, what if there's no creator God and, and we just evolved millions of years ago from worms, or there's a happy thought, then like some evolutionist, for example. Now, here's Richard Dawkins, very famous evolutionist. He describes the universe in this way. We live in a universe which has no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good. Nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Whoa! <laughs> well, if that's what you believe about this universe that we inhabit, it's going to produce a very different view of the afterlife, morality, meaning of life, and just about everything else, right? It produces a very different worldview. Another evolutionist said this, there are no gods, no purposeful forces of any kind, no life after death. There is no ultimate foundation for ethics, no ultimate meaning in life, and no free will for humans either. <laughs> Makes you feel all warm and fuzzy inside, doesn't it? That's terrible. But so, so what you believe about origins greatly impacts your worldview, your view of of the major questions of life, even the meaning of life, and so on. But we're, we're talking about worldviews this morning. All world and life views begin with presuppositions. Worldview, world and life views, a slightly updated term. If you've never heard of the term worldview before, maybe that's new to some of you. Here's a dictionary definition. A worldview is a set of presuppositions and beliefs that every person has which shape how we make sense of the world and everything in it. So. Every one of us has a worldview, even, even atheists. People, everybody on earth has a worldview. You might be conscious of it or not, but everybody has a worldview, and all worldviews begin with beliefs. Even, even secular, like atheistic worldviews, and so, some people say, well, I, I just believe science. And say, so, well, you believe. Every worldview begins with beliefs. So for the Christian worldview, our topic here this morning, what are the foundational beliefs for our worldview? I'm going to assume most of us are Christians here this morning. Maybe not everybody. That's okay. The foundational beliefs, where it all starts, is a high view of Scripture, the authority of the Bible. That's where, that's where the Christian worldview begins. In, in fact, the more we incorporate ideas outside of the Bible that we might, we, we might be influenced by the media or by our friends or whatever, the more we incorporate outside ideas, the more humanistic our worldview becomes and the less Christian it becomes. So, I mean, nobody has a perfectly Christian worldview. There are all in, we all have inconsistencies. But spiritual growth, our walk with Christ over time, we should be becoming more Christian in our thinking and then our behavior. But behavior follows belief, right? We start with knowing about God and how to love him and serve him better, and then that works its way out over time into how we act and how we serve and so on. There was a preacher in England uh, not that long ago, in the 1950s and 60s, fairly well-known, not real famous, but a great, great Bible-teaching preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. don't know if anybody knows that name. He wasn't, wasn't that well-known, but he made this amazing statement here. There can be no doubt whatsoever that, look at this, all the troubles in the church today and most of the troubles in the world are due to a departure from the authority of the Bible. That's huge. All the troubles in the church and most of the troubles in the world are due to a departure from a high view of Scripture? That's massive. And, and this, is, this is not some first-year seminary student. It's Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. The doctor is his nickname. He was a surgeon. He was actually, actually an actual doctor. And then he left that to, uh, to, to, to start a church and preach. But incredible. So if we want to picture, if we want to use an analogy to picture the structure of the Christian world and life view, I kind of use, I kind of think of a house. We can use a house as an analogy to picture how these pieces fit together. And here in Canada, we dig down below the frost line, we put down a foundation, and the foundation sits on footings. That is the rock solid base that supports the rest of the structure. That would represent biblical authority. That's, that, that's where everything begins. We could spend all our time here this morning talking just about biblical authority. It's that important, but that's not our main subject. I'm going to move on now. The foundation of the house, I'm going to label as the Genesis creation account. Now, why would the foundation of the Christian world and life view be the Genesis creation account? It's because the meaning of things 
is tied to how it started. The, the meaning of something is tied to how it began. And so many things began in Genesis. In Genesis, we have the origin of the universe, life, man, marriage, evil, language, government, culture, nations, religion, etc., etc. There's so many things that God kicked off there in Genesis that help us understand what the purpose of those things is today. It might change over time, but it, it's still tied to its, its origin. And out of that, from that from those footings and that foundation, we have the outworking of the Christian worldview. That that's the, the main level. We don't, we don't generally live in the basement, right? We live on the main floor, and you, you might have 30-year-old kids who've moved back in with you, and they play video games all day in the basement. Now, that, that's a discussion for another time, but we live on the main floor. That's where we eat, that's where we sleep, that's where we have guests over and so on. So the, the, out of that, from those footings and that foundation, we have a Christian view then of things like law and government and art and music and economics and education and family, etc., etc. So there's the structure of the Christian world and life view. And the foundation is so critical to, under, to, to working out the Christian world and life view. So before we get into creation evolution or even contemplate the rest of this structure here, we need to be very, very certain of the genre of literature of Genesis. We need to interpret the Bible properly. Because if you get Genesis wrong, you're going to get creation wrong. You're going to, you're going to get all kinds, of, all kinds of other... You're off on the wrong foot before you even get started. And so we're talking about creation evolution. So we need to interpret Genesis properly. Because see, some people say Genesis is poetry. It's just, it's just poetry. It's, it's not history. It's not God said this and then this happened. God said this and then this happened and so on. It's just a poetic account of creation. And, and if, it's, if it is poetry then we could probably fit in evolution over millions of years that humans evolved from apes and uh, all kinds of different things there. But if Genesis is written as history, then that's going to provide more defined goalposts for us to really understand how God got us here, how God got the universe here. Now, we're blessed to have many examples in our Bibles of Hebrew poetry where there's no debate, like Genesis. That you have... you and and. and Hebrew poetry is a little different than our poetry. English poetry is characterized by rhyme and meter. Not so with Hebrew poetry. In Hebrew poetry, here's an example for, uh, for example, an example for example. Yeah. Uh, here's a verse, for example. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. That's an example of parallelism. Parallelism, and that's synonymous parallelism where the first statement is repeated in different words. You can see that there, right? Parallelism is a major feature of Hebrew poetry. And there's different kinds of parallelism. For example, here in, Psalm, here in Proverbs 28, whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool, but he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. That's an example of antithetical parallelism, where the first statement is repeated by a statement of the opposite. And you can see that there's an example of that there. So that's a major feature of Hebrew poetry. And there's some other features as well. But knowing what Hebrew poetry looks like, we can now look for those features back in Genesis. And there have been uh, experts who've done exactly that. Here's one of those guys, Dr. Stephen Boyd. He's got a PhD in Hebraic and cognate studies, like Hebrew and the languages surrounding Hebrew and how it originated and so on. And he did the extra step of not just reading both of them. He did a computer analysis of the verb structure of Genesis looking for those features of Hebrew poetry. Here's one of the outputs from this fairly uh, advanced study. There's Genesis 1 way up there, and he determined that the probability that Genesis is history, not poetry, is 99.997%. <laughs> so, so not, you know, 50-50. Could, could go either way. Maybe it's poetry, maybe it's history. Not really sure. It's all the way over on the history side. Right? So Genesis is written as a historical account. Historical prose is, is the genre of literature there in Genesis. Actually, if you want a poetic account of creation, have a look at Psalm 104. Psalm 104 is a creation account, but it's written in poetry. And you can clearly see the difference. Read Genesis 1, read Psalm 104. They're both creation accounts, yes, but they're written in very different styles of literature. Let's move on. Let's go a little bit deeper now. So now we, okay, Genesis is history. So we've, 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 we've got that out of the way. So let's move forward a little bit. There's a Christian view of 
anthropology, anthropos, man, humans. What is a Christian view of humans? What can we deduce from the Bible? Start with the Bible in our thinking, right? We want to be Christian in our thinking. Well, God made male and female, two genders, only two, in his image, not the image of animals. They're equal in significance and value, and there's one race. We all go back to Adam and Eve and more recently Noah's family, but there's, there's one race. The Bible, te- the Bible doesn't teach races. It teaches nations and people groups. Ethnos is the, is the Greek word in the New Testament for nations. But So how do we explain the differences in skin shade then? That's, that's a question that comes up. You might notice in some of our kids' books after the service, we depict Adam and Eve as middle brown. Not, not African black or Caucasian white, but middle brown. Why do we do that? Because Adam and Eve were probably middle brown. From a middle brown couple, even today, you can get the entire variation in skin shade. You might remember Punnett squares from your, your high school days. Or, yeah, or maybe you don't want to remember Punnett squares from your high school This is church this morning. What are you doing talking about school? But it's, it, it, is this just a theory? Is it, well, maybe a middle brown couple can get all these variations? I mean, most of their kids are going to be around middle brown. A little darker, a little lighter, but, but genetically, it can work out that you get the extremes. And that does actually happen on occasion. That happened about a decade and a half ago. We wrote that up in our Creation magazine. Here's a cover. See those babies down there at the bottom? They're twins. <laughs> one's black, one's white. Here's what the article looked like. A middle brown mom and dad had a black baby and a white baby. Same generation. So... We can explain as Christians with high school genetics, nothing more complex than that, the distribution of skin shades around the world. It's not that hard. And there's one race. We can explain it from one people group. There aren't different races. The evolutionary explanation for different skin shades gets racist real fast. And it gets very racist real fast. Uh, But not so with the Christian view. So there's a Christian view of anthropology. What about a Christian view of the history of the earth? How how did the world start? And so what can we deduce from the Bible? Well, we can deduce, not really that difficult, that God created recently in six earth rotation days. Then there was a global flood about 1,600, 1,700 years after that. Then the Tower of Babel about 100 years later. And if this is the first time somebody's told you, well, the earth might not be billions of years old, you might be thinking, that's crazy. Because that's what I thought the first time somebody told me that. I thought, that's ridiculous. Everybody knows the earth is millions of years old. And as odd as that might sound, that is not a new idea. In fact, that was the majority position for most of earth history. Up until about 250 years ago, now the majority position is millions of years, billions of years, 4.6 billion years for the age of the earth. But that's not that unusual. Many people and many even committees have gotten together over many years. I've got a three-page table here of all kinds of people that have gotten together and and tried to calculate using the Bible and other historical documents, when did God start the earth? How old is the earth? How old is the universe? You can see the dates they came up with there on the right-hand side. Not millions, but only thousands of years. Here's page two. Um, And and the dates they came up with there, there's page three, last page. Even second from the top there is Johann Kepler. Kepler was a famous, you might know that name, he was a famous scientist. He was one of those so-called founding fathers of science. He was the discoverer of the planetary laws of motion. And he believed the Bible. People today say you, you can't be a Christian, you can't believe the Bible and do good science. That's nonsense. Some of the greatest scientists ever believed the Bible. And they did good science. Kepler was one of them, came up with a creation date of 3993 BC. Again, did good science, believed creation. What about the days in Genesis? That's, that gets controversial too, because people think, well, wh- what does the word day mean? Could, could, you, could we get the millions of years that we hear so much about? Could we stretch out the days? Let's have a look. The word day has about a dozen different meanings, both in English and in the, in the Hebrew of the Bible there. One of those meanings is a full rotation of the planet, one cycle of light and dark. That's one of the meanings of about a dozen. Sometimes the word day refers to just the light portion of an earth rotation, as in, you might say, uh, my, 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 uh, I, I work in the day and I sleep at night, for example, right? That, that's a different usage of the word day. Sometimes the word day refers to just the portion allotted to work or school. I might say my work day starts at eight and ends at five. 
That's, that's yet another usage of the word day. Sometimes the word day is synonymous with the word time. We just swap out the word day with the word time. It's used that way, for example, in Genesis 2, right here. In the day, or we could say in the time that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. That's its meaning there in Genesis 2. And there's figures of speech as well, like go ahead, make my day, if you're familiar with movies from the 70s and, and that kind of thing. And, but the controversy over the word day is in chapter 1 of Genesis. The first time the word day appears is in verse 5. It appears twice in that verse, and it has a slightly different meaning both times. Let's have a look. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. So in this first instance here, which of those meanings applied? God called the light day. Which of those meanings apply? What, what does it mean? It's, 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 the, it's the daylight portion of an earth rotation, right? It's that one there. What, was that hard for any of you to figure out? It's easy, right? It, it, it's, the word day is a fairly simple word. Let, let's move on. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening... And there was morning the first day. What does it mean? A full rotation of the earth, right? That was, that was fast. You guys got, and you're not all English scholars, are you? Maybe you are, I don't know. But the point is, the word day is an easy word, right? There are words in scripture that are more difficult to figure out. Sanctification, propitiation, justification. Those words take essays, to unpack their full meaning. The word day isn't like those. It, I mean, it's as plain as day, right? Sorry. But it's easy to understand. So why, why is the word day so controversial in Genesis? It's not, let's just admit it, it's not controversial because the text is difficult to understand, right? It's controversial. Why? Because of outside ideas. We've, we've heard millions of years, billions of years, so much. There's this great temptation for us to try to stretch out the days and try to get the millions of years into Genesis. But the text doesn't allow it. If we start our thinking with a high view of Scripture, God's word is first, our opinion is a distant second, we're not going to be confused about this. Now, we'll, we'll get to science in a minute because we hear millions. Of, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But let's start with the biblical text. God creates recently in six earth rotation days. So for you visual learners, again, we can, we can do a bit of a timeline here, put these things on the screen. One, two, three, four, five, six. God creates in six days. Actually, those would be stretched out in a sequence, but I don't have the screen space here. What's the next major event of a Christian view of the history of the earth? I think the next major event is at the conclusion of day six, once everything is there, God describes his initial creation as very good. Initially, the creation was very good. The key event in history. Is the creation very good today? No. <laughs> we, th there's, there's a remnant of that very good world there, right? We might see some amazing sunset or, or, or some flower that, that's in, in, amazingly designed or some animal that does some incredible thing. But there's also very bad things. There's both moral evil and natural evil. Moral evil is evil people doing evil things. And, and because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we contribute to that, uh, unfortunately. And then there's natural evil. Earthquakes, tsunamis, mudslides, droughts, disease, uh, bugs, uh, cancer, uh, diseases that cause pain and kill people. So what happened to God's very good world? Well, I'm, I'm sure most of you know, as we move along in history, this happened. Adam and Eve sinned. And that made Apple computers. Or, no. No. Adam and Eve sinned, and that's where death and bad things entered the world. Death, what, what did God say to Adam? Genesis 3, 19, God said to Adam, I made you from dust, you're going to go back to dust. Physical death is a direct result of Adam's sin, his disobedience against God. And, and, and along, that, along with that, many other things, terrible things, diseases and so on, that's how we can explain, understanding biblical history is how we can explain why there's this duality in creation. There's both very good things, there is, and there's things that are awful. Do, do, so does the, do, do we say then there's a duality in God? No. God created a world that was very good. Sin messed it up and continues to mess it up. 
We don't blame God for evil. God is not evil. That's, that's, that's our doing. That's Adam's doing originally, and we perpetuate that, unfortunately. Then let, let's move on a little bit. We get to about 1,700 years after that, a global flood. Another major event in history. The whole human population before the flood, whatever it was, could have been millions of people, was reduced to eight and rebooted at the time of the flood. And Bible-believing geophysicists believe there was one continent originally that broke up rapidly during the flood, like in a meters per second type of movement, not inches per year, but meters per second. There's some powerful geophysics behind that, done by the world's leading geophysicist, by the way, who's a Bible-believing Christian. Just there you go. But uh, incredible event, dramatically reshaping the surface of the planet. And then many years after that, we get to the central events of the whole history of the universe, the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. So there's, a, there's kind of a summary of the biblical history that we can glean from our Bibles. Now, it's important to put dates on events, because if you don't put dates on events, I don't know if we have Sunday school teachers here or homeschoolers or whatever, uh, if, you, if, you, if you just have a string of events and you don't have dates, what you have is once upon a time. It's a fairy tale. So let's put some dates on these. Those first events around 6,000 years ago, about 4,000 BC, just ballpark figures here. You can stretch it out a little bit here. And again, just ballpark figures. The flood happened around 2,400 BC, about 4,400 years ago. And Jesus' death and resurrection was either in 30 or 33. There's good arguments going for, for both of those. It, it was one of those years. I, I sort of favor 33 AD. So if, if it was 33 AD, in nine years from now, it's going to be 2033 It'll be the 2000th, 2000th anniversary of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we might want to think how we're going to celebrate that, right? That is, that is the pivotal event in the whole history of the universe. And we're coming up on 2,000 years. So we, we got nine years to plan here, so don't panic, but uh, something we might want to consider. Major event in history. Now, okay, there is a history that we can glean from Scripture. The problem with that is... The world says that that's wrong. <laughs> that's not the true history of the world. You Christians, your Bible, that, that's, that's false, that's wrong. Why? Science. Science disproves the history that comes from our Bibles. Okay? Let's talk about science. Let's, let's investigate that. And as, as, we, let, as we move into science here, let me preface this by making this statement. I believe the Bible's true. And, and so I'm going to say, since the history of the Christian world and life view is true, biblically based, scientific observations will fit. Scientific observations will fit into that history more neatly, more cleanly than they will a false history, let, let's say, of evolution over millions of years. So that's the prediction. And, and let's, let's see how that works itself out. We're going to play a little game here called Which History Fits Best? And here's our scorecard, and we'll look at some scientific observations, and we'll see which history, either biblical history or the millions of years evolutionary history, provides the best framework for understanding those scientific observations. That might sound a little complex. We'll do a few examples. You'll see how this goes. It's actually kind of fun. Let's start with this. The Earth's magnetic field is getting weaker over time. And I don't mean that it's, that it's getting ready to flip north for south. And maybe doing that, the, but the overall strength of the field is getting weaker over time. Measurements going back to about 1835 suggest it's getting weaker at about 5% per century. And archaeological discoveries from about 1,000 years ago indicate that it was about, a, about 40% stronger 1,000 years ago. Now, if we just extrapolate that decay back into the past, going back to only 10,000 years, not 10 million or 10 billion, only 10,000 years ago, the magnetic field, the magnetic strength of the earth would have been so strong that it would have started to melt the earth. Which history fits best? It's the history that says that the earth is not billions of years old. Biblical history. Cool. I love being a Christian. See, so, so what did we just do? We just looked at one little scientific observation, and that observation fits neatly into biblical history it's much more difficult to fit it into the evolutionary history. They try to, but they have to make excuses. And, well, you know, we, we can't extrapolate it that way, and it did something else, it was different. We don't need to do that. We can look at the science, and we can say, yeah, cool. 
fits with the Bible. Love being a Christian. Let's, let's move on. We, we got what, four to go here. Rivers are like freight trains, constantly taking land from the continents and delivering it to the bottom of the oceans. The continents are being eroded by rivers 24-7, month after month, century after century. The average height reduction for all the continents is about six centimeters per 1,000 years. At that rate, the continents would all be eroded down to sea level. They'd be gone in less than 10 million years. And that's if we, let, let's just leave the flood out of it for now, because the flood would have massively eroded the continents. But let's just go with river erosion. Just river erosion, according to the evolutionists, there shouldn't be any continents because they believe the continents are on the order of two and a half billion years old. Do you know how much continent you could have eroded in two and a half billion years at today's measured rates? You could have eroded a continent that started 150 kilometers tall. And in two and a half billion years, it would be eroded to sea level. Which history fits best? Biblical history. Cool. I love me a Christian. And of course, the, the flood would have eroded those much faster than, than 10 million years. But incredible. So there's another one that fits with the Bible. Let's keep going. Supernovas. Anybody know what a supernova is? You heard that before? Okay. Uh, for the, the supernova is a star that's exploded. Sometimes stars are unstable and they blow up. And they, they often form beautiful objects in space. There are supernova remnants. And, and they form beautiful, that's the leftover gas and dust from the blown up star, forms beautiful objects in space. That's the ring nebula taken with the James Webb Space Telescope there. There's the southern ring nebula, nebula that's, a, that's what that one's called. Now, we can make predictions of the supernovas in the Milky Way galaxy, in our own galaxy. There are different stages. The third stage are the very oldest, very largest supernova remnants. And looking just at our own galaxy, just the Milky Way, not the whole universe, if we go with the standard model, the Big Bang model, billions of years and so on, there should be about 5,000 or so of the very oldest, very largest supernova remnants. But if the Bible's history is anywhere close to being accurate, the predictions are very, very different. We really shouldn't be seeing any of those very oldest, very largest supernova remnants. Now, what's the data? What are astronomers actually observing in the telescopes? Here's the data. The Milky Way is not billions of years old. Which history fits best? Biblical history. Cool. I love being a Christian. Have I said that already? Maybe I have. It's fun though, isn't it? It's, it's fun for Bible believers. And, if, and if, you're, if you don't believe the Bible here this morning, I would gently ask that you consider the truth claims of Scripture. This is going to be challenging for you. So far, evolution's not scored any points here. But, but now it might. Let's talk about dinosaurs. Now some of you might be thinking, okay, well, now evolution's going to score a point here because dinosaurs fit with evolution. Don't they? <laughs> you might suspect something, given the, the, the history here, but scientists have made amazing, mind-boggling discoveries. Over the last 15, 20 years, they found instance after instance of soft tissue in dinosaur bones. More than 85 discoveries now, and that's a, that number's old, uh, but they found, they found things like soft and stretchy tissue. Uh, this is, you're looking under a microscope here, that's T-Rex tissue. And the lab technician, they could take tweezers and they could pull it apart a little bit and it would snap back together like a little rubber band. It's soft and stretchy, like fleshy stuff from inside a Tyrannosaurus rex dinosaur femur, the leg bone. Incredible stuff. Scientists have seen different kinds of dinosaur blood cells and blood vessels. That's from a Triceratops. That's Triceratops blood you're looking at there. That's the one with the, with the three horns and the frill. The kids all know the names and, and stuff. I have to help you guys a little bit. But um, scientists have analyzed different kinds of dinosaur proteins, including histones. That's the kind of protein normally associated with building the double helical structure of DNA. And they found little bits of dino DNA. Now, not enough to fire up Jurassic Park all over again, so, you know, too bad. But uh, those are incredible discoveries. Which history fits best? Now, now, remember, the evolutionary history says dinosaurs all died out about 65 million years ago. These ones didn't. <laughs> Which history fits best? The Bible's history is the hands-down winner here. For people who believe, and this is what we've all been taught, dinosaurs died millions of years ago. Now you have a problem with science. 
because science can prove that soft and stretchy tissue like this, uh, biological structures, organic tissue, will rot <laughs> over that incredible period of time. I mean, not even some really good Tupperware is going to preserve it. It, it, like, you know, honestly, you could put that stuff in formaldehyde. The formaldehyde is not going to last 65 million years. Powerful support for the history that we can glean from Scripture. And for those of you, I'm, I'm going to guess that not all of you here this morning are into science, like maybe I am or maybe some, some others are. Even if you're not in, into science, like, like we're doing here in these, these, this section, if you just start your thinking from the Bible you'll have answers that are superior to PhD scientists. If you just you, you, you look at some of this stuff and, oh, okay, dinosaurs, according, according to scripture and the history that we can glean from the Bible, I think dinosaurs probably lived until pretty recently. And you know what? You're right. Even if there's PhD scientists that say, well, we believe dinosaurs died 70 million years ago and so... If you just start your thinking from the Bible, I mean, who's smarter, scientists or God? It's a Sunday school question, isn't it? Ah, uh, Jesus? Yes. <laughs> Let's do one more. Canyon formation. Canyons. Any, anybody, you think of Grand Canyon. That's probably the world's most famous canyon. Anybody been to Grand Canyon? Or you've been, there's, there's other beautiful canyons around the world. What is, even if you've never been to any major canyons, what is the typical history that's applied to canyon formation? You know it. River erosion, right? Slow processes over eons of time. Rain and frost breaking apart the rocks and river erosion. Here's Bryce Canyon where there's a family a number of years ago. You can hike down into the canyon. There's uh, beautiful places there in the American Southwest. And uh, of course, you think of Grand Canyon. We did some rafting on, on the Colorado River as well. And the river guide and all the guides there will tell you that the Colorado River slowly, one sand grain at a time, carved out this massive hole in the ground, right? The Grand Canyon. In some places, 18 miles across. And, and, and here's the Fraser River out in BC. And okay, so if we, think of, if we think of river erosion and canyons and rivers forming canyons and so on, obviously larger, more powerful rivers like the Fraser River here are going to erode the valleys that they flow through faster than smaller rivers like this guy here, for example. So more water means faster canyon erosion. Now, there was a time in biblical history when there was much more water, wasn't there? Okay, so could the flood, especially toward the end of the flood, when the water level starts to decrease and then it runs off of the continents, could that have been a period of intense erosion carving massive trenches in the ground in various places on the continents? Yes, Bible-believing science has been thinking along those lines for decades. That's nothing new. Do we have an example of that? Again, is that, is that just a theory? Well, maybe the flood could do something like that. Or do we have an example where canyons formed not slowly and gradually as a result of river erosion, but something more catastrophic? Yes, we do. Here's a canyon, not nearly as big as Grand Canyon, but it's about 600 feet across and 150 feet deep. So a, a, a sizable little canyon there. And you can see the little river, maybe you can't from the back. It's a very small river running down the middle of a canyon. And if we went to this canyon today, we might suppose that that river carved the canyon over hundreds or maybe into the thousands of years. But we'd be wrong. That canyon didn't take a thousand years, didn't take a hundred years, didn't take ten years, didn't even take one year. That canyon was cut in a day. That's a one-day canyon. What happened here? This is a picture from the base of Mount St. Helens in southern Washington state. Mount St. Helens is a volcano. What happened was the volcano erupted. There was ice and snow up on top of the mountain. That melted very quickly, and that produced a mud flow that came through this area, twice highway speed, carving out that canyon. And then the river formed. See, the river wasn't even there before the canyon was there. The, the, the reason there's a river there today is because when it rains, the rainwater collects in the canyon and it forms that little stream. But the river had nothing to do with the canyon's formation. So it's not that the river caused the canyon, it's the canyon caused the river. It's the opposite of what we normally think. And yet, if, we, if you're not familiar with the true history of this area around this canyon here, you, you, you wouldn't come up with that idea at all. You'd think, oh, the, the river slowly did that 
over eons of time. If we have a look at the sidewalls of this canyon here, see that layer between the yellow dotted lines? That was laid down in about three hours on June 12th, 1980, again as a result of an eruption of the volcano. What blue geologists' minds is when they had a close-up view of that layer. Here's a close-up view. Look at that fine layering. Geologists are used to thinking of those little layers, just millimeters thick there, as maybe one or two of them, like a pair of layers being laid down a year, two layers a year. And yet here's dozens of layers in just a few inches in a sequence that was deposited in three hours. Some amazing things happen around Mount St. Helens. And yet Mount St. Helens was just a, a few mud flows from the top of a mountain, did, did some pretty interesting things. But if a few little mud flows can do interesting things like this, what might a global flood accomplish? Right? Does, does that lead to something like Noah's, Noah, uh, like Grand Canyon, things like that? And, and the more we study canyons, the more we're coming away with the notion that, once again, the Bible provides the superior historical framework, especially including a global flood, to understand the Earth's surface geology, including canyons, even Grand Canyon. I had the opportunity in the mid-90s to go whitewater rafting through the, down the Colorado River through Grand Canyon for five days, sleeping out beside the river underneath the stars at night. It's amazing. Some of the biggest whitewater in the world these huge, huge waves that we were on these massive rafts, like 18 people per raft and stuff. Just incredible. And they call that extreme sports. That's, that's extreme sports, right? Anybody do any extreme sports? And, and uh, I was at a church in Tofield uh, on Friday night and, and, and a little bit more out in the country there. And I said, I, I've seen some of the tractors that you guys drive around here. That's an extreme sport. It's massive things. And, oh. But um, I was rafting down the canyon uh, through, the, through the canyon with creation geologists and paleontologists, PhD scientists. And we were studying the evidence in the canyon for rapid deposition of all those layers you see there and rapid erosion of the canyon in, in a flood, post-flood type scenario. And guess what? The more we study Grand Canyon, the more we're coming away with the notion that that thing did not form slowly and gradually. There are too many clues there in the structure of the rocks and the structure of the canyon for catastrophic processes, high energy processes, that we would expect going on in a global flood. There's even a DVD out there that you can pick up, Rafting the Grand Canyon, featuring a lot of the pictures I took and the rocks and fossils we looked at. Had a great time there. So there's a Christian view of the history of the earth. And, and under that, that heading, I suppose we could think of geology. There's a Christian view of geology. God made land on day three, and it's been modified by a flood. We see that. We see that there. In astronomy, there's a Christian view of astronomy. God made stars and galaxies on day four, and they are decaying. We looked at the supernovas there. Sometimes stars blow up and so on. What do you think? Is there a Christian view of paleontology, of fossils? And now some of you might be saying, okay, now you've really gone too far. No, there's no Christian view of fossils. Fossils have no bearing on any biblical doctrines or the gospel or my life. And my view on paleontology doesn't matter. Okay, well, let's, let's proceed anyway. Uh, uh, scientists have found some very interesting, or, or uh, I'll use the word disturbing, disturbing things in the fossil record. The fossil record is a record of death, right? It's dead things. That, that's, that's bad enough. But it's also a record of violent death, animals being torn apart as they're, as they're fossilized. It's a record of pain. It's a record of, there's many diseases, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, bone cancer very prevalent in the fossil records all over the place. It's a record of extinction, of carnivorous activity. There's fossil thorns and there's fossil humans, very high in the fossil record. So with all of those things in the fossil record, let me throw out this question here. Where do the fossils fit? In, in, in biblical history, we can put up a snippet of biblical history here. Where in biblical history was the fossil record established? Well, how about here? You have a global flood rapidly burying plants and animals. And then we encounter verses in our Bibles like this, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. So you, most of you probably know, okay, thorns and thistles weren't a part of the original very good creation, right? They're a result of the curse. Thorns are mentioned specifically as a result of the curse. So since there are fossil thorns, the fossil record must have come after sin and death entered the world, and God cursed his creation. So we put the fossil record there, and it works. That, that's okay. And then in the New Testament, Romans 5, we read, just, uh, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death 
through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. And there are human fossils in the fossil record. And so since death came into the world as a result of Adam's sin, humans and the animals, there's a, he, there's a Hebrew term that characterizes both humans and animals. Uh, they're, they're obviously animal death. And there's some humans in the fossil record as well. And again, that works if we place it there after sin. And in the New Testament, we read in, in 1 Corinthians 15, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So now you've got a connection between the first Adam and Jesus. Jesus' nickname is the last Adam. So because of what happened back in Genesis there, God said, Adam, you're going to die. Physical death is a direct result of sin. And, and so the wages of sin is death. You, you, you know that verse, right? And that, that, hap, that, that link between sin and death was set up way back there in Genesis at the time of the very first sin. Physical death is a result. That's why Jesus, the last Adam, had to pay the price of physical death on a cross so that all those who accept the free gift of God of salvation in Christ Jesus, when they die, they don't need to pay for their own sins. Because they've already been paid for by a substitute. It's called substitutionary atonement. Jesus paid the price. The price for sin is physical death. He paid that price on a cross. So that for anyone who believes, we don't need to pay for our own sins. That's the Christian message in a nutshell. You don't need to pay for your own sins. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're, we all deserve hell. If, if, one of the things you might want to be careful about doing is, is praying to God for justice, that God would give justice. Justice means we all go to hell. That's justice. Pray for God's mercy. In his mercy, he himself sent his own son. Jesus is God. And he himself paid the price, a price that... We ought to pay. We're the criminals here. We've sinned against a holy God. We deserve hell. That would be right. That would be just. That would be good. We, we expect criminals to pay, their, to pay the fine or, or do the time or whatever. We're the criminals here. But we don't need to go that route. That's the good news of Christianity. You don't need to go that route. Accept God's free gift, his mercy in sending his son. And anyway, okay, that's the gospel rabbit trail, important rabbit trail. But if the fossil record is at that point, great. It all works out. That's fine. But there are many people, and even including people in the church, that say, no, 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 no. That's not where the fossils go. The fossil record was laid down slowly over millions of years. The fossils actually go over here. Can you see some problems with that? Yeah. So if the fossil record was established slowly over millions of years, and there are death and suffering and all kinds of terrible things recorded there in the fossil record, and then 6,000 years ago or so, God steps back and says, my completed creation is very good. No. Right? How, how does that work? If, if we're going to insist that the fossil record is millions of years old, then we have to somehow get that uh, that. that, that very good out of scripture. God does not call things like cancer, pain, violent death, very good. So we have to sort of, yeah, that's just a spiritual thing, or, or, or maybe there's some other way to understand, or maybe Genesis is poetry after all, and, and we, we have to somehow get that out of there. What about the next one? It was supposed to be Adam's sin that was the transition between very good to not very good, to sin and death entering the world and bad things. But if there's already been millions of years of death and bad things, then what did Adam's sin do? There's, there's really no connection between sin and death. Death and ter terrible things were here before sin. Well, then Adam's sin didn't bring those things in. So that one has to go as well. There's really no link between Adam's sin, his sin. Who knows what his sin, his, his disobedience meant? It wasn't really connected with death. And then what about the next one, global flood? Well, if the fossil record is already there, and then you have a global flood, a global flood is going to rip up the original rock record and redistribute it. So people who want to add millions of years into the Bible, they're forced to say that Noah's flood was a little flood, not a global flood. The Bible clearly describes it as a global flood, but they're forced to say that it's a little flood, only over in ancient Mesopotamia, that kind of thing. And, and if it was a little flood, why did Noah just not pick up and move? Why build the ark? 
Why, why take all the animals on the ark? Anyway, it all falls apart. But anyways, it has to be a local flood if we go with the millions of years. Now, what about that last one here? Well, we dare not X that out. That's the central teachings of our faith, right? But logically, that one goes as well. Because by breaking the link between sin and death back in Genesis, if Adam's sin really has nothing to do with physical death, then Jesus didn't die to pay for our sins. And, and that's how, by adding millions or attempting to add millions of years into the Bible, if you work the logic through, you end up with the destruction of Christianity. Now, I've, I've gone very quickly here through, through this in the last five minutes, but that's what you end up with. By breaking the link between sin and death, the main teaching of Christianity is destroyed. This is not a side issue. What we think about specifically death, and, and the fossil record is a record of death, has a dramatic impact on the central teachings of Christianity. But that's not right, right? That's, th this works very well. The fossil record at the time of the flood, that works. We don't have a theological problem, and we have a mechanism to produce the fossil record. But this is not without its own challenges. If we go with this, which works very well, we have to jettison from our minds the idea that the fossil record is millions of years old. And that is a, that's a stumbling block for a lot of people. You might think, okay, yeah, I believe God created, but he did it over millions of years. If you struggle with God creating recently, the flood is the key to understanding the age of the earth. It really is. Because a flood would dramatically accelerate many things that would take millions of years at the rates we see today. Like erosion, sedimentation, mountain building, continental drift. All of those things were dramatically accelerated at the time of the flood. Uh, it's the key to understanding the age of the earth. So there is a Christian view of paleontology. Paleontology fossils are dead things. Death and, death and bad things came after sin. And we could go on and talk about many, many different subjects. The bottom line is a Christian world and life view provides the best framework for understanding the scientific observations. So there is a Christian view, not just of law and government art and so on. There's also a Christian view of geology and paleontology and astronomy and physics, et cetera, et cetera. And, and by the way, most branches of science were founded by creationists anyways. You might recognize some of these names up here. Creationists, every single one of them. A lot of them were young earth creationists to boot. There you go. But you, so you can do good science and be a creationist. Uh, not, a, not a problem there. Uh, so, but the, in all of this, the Genesis creation account is critical to getting the right answer to, to building a solid Christian worldview. It's such a foundational issue. If, if we get creation wrong, we're going to get it wrong in many other areas. So I've zipped through some of these things here very quickly. I'm going to make some recommendations as I wrap up here. If you want to get more of this kind of stuff that I've talked about very quickly, my number one recommendation is get yourself on the mailing list for our creation magazine. It's our flagship publication. It's gone out for more than 46 years. Now it goes out to over 100 countries all around the world. And it's basically a continuation of, of that which history fits best game that we played there, right? In article after article, look at this new discovery in this animal, or look at this, here's something in astronomy or physics or whatever. It fits with the Bible. So does this, and so does this, and so does this, and so does this, on and on again. And it just, it helps you develop a more robust Christian worldview. Seeing it, you're, you're seeing God, essentially, in all of these different areas in his creation, and it builds faith. It encourages faith. And we've had non-believers come to faith. They read the magazine and, and, and atheists come to Christ. So incredible. I think it's our number one equipping tool. Um, there's lots of other good stuff back there. But uh, if you want to sign up, here's how it works. We'll, set up, we'll start by setting up an automatic billing, $750 every three months to either your bank account or credit card. It's up to you. It doesn't, bank account's a little bit easier for us, but it's it, whichever one you want. And for that, you'll get a hard copy, an actual physical copy of the magazine, obviously. You also get a digital copy to your email address. You can flip through that on your, on your, on your phone, your device, your laptop, your desktop, whatever it might be. And if you sign up this morning, you get your first issue for free. It's out there at the table. You also get a free DVD. So there you go. It's, it's kind of like, but wait, there's more. But can, can you sign up for the magazine at, on our website at creation.com next week or next month? Yes, of course you can, but you don't get the free stuff. 
So if you sign up this morning, you get some free stuff. Anyways, the sign-up sheets this time look like this. And if we could start those around at this point, that would be great as I wrap up here. And these ones are similar to the blue ones, but these are double-sided. So it, fill in your address information on the front, your payment information on the back. So these are the yellow forms, not the blue ones. And then just hand that in at the back there. That's where you get your free stuff. Now, as those go around, there's, there's some other uh, books as well. My, my number one recommendation is the magazine. But if you're a book person, if you like to read, get this one here. The Creation Answers book answers more than 60 of the most asked questions. Those questions that Cain's wife, and how do you explain the different shades of skin, the races, and so on, and arguments for uh, all kinds of different things. 60 of the most asked questions in a, in a single book. It's our most popular book for that reason. Now, there's another kind of creation answer, another answers book out there called Christianity for Skeptics. This is actually not a creation book. It deals with these subjects that skeptics will throw at the Bible and, and discusses those. And we've packaged the two of these together, two great books. It's a discount pack. You can save a few bucks, but you can get them, sep get them separately too. If you want to study Genesis in detail, maybe I've piqued your interest in that book of the Bible and you want to study Genesis, then I'd recommend this one. We have a commentary that takes you through the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Now, now just a warning, this thing's nearly 800 pages, right? It, it's huge. You could hurt somebody with this. That's not what it's for. But uh, why is it so big if it only covers 11 chapters of the Bible? The reason it's so big is because it does what commentaries do. It draws the meaning from the text, going back to the original Hebrew in many cases. Here's the nuances of what God's word means. And we've put in the science that supports what the Bible says. So in one volume, you get it all. You get the theology and the science side by side. I call it the Rolls Royce of creation books. So you get, you get everything in one book. And it's a large book. We also have a small group study based on the Genesis accounts called the Genesis Academy. It's 12 approximately half hour DVD sessions and then a free study guide that you can print. You can print a copy for everybody in the group or, or, or have it as a personal study or whatever. It takes you through Genesis 1 to 11. For those of you who want the science that refutes evolution, maybe you're going to university or maybe you've got kids in university that are struggling with other, others who believe that oh, science proves evolution and so on, then I'd recommend this one, Evolution's Achilles Heels. It's authored by nine PhD scientists that blow evolution out of the water scientifically. So if you want the science that refutes evolution, then I'd recommend this one here. For those of you who are really serious and, or, or, or maybe a little bit nuts, We've got this thing out there called the Creation Library Starter Pack. Almost everything I just mentioned is in that pack. You can see the massive commentary there. The Creation Answers book, Christianity for Skeptics, Evolution's Achilles Heels, a selection of DVDs. There's a dinosaur book. There's some kids' resources in there. What we've done with this pack is we've massively discounted it. It's over 375 bucks for just under 200 And there's some kids' packs out there as well, discount packs. Grandma and Grandpa, if you're looking for gifts for your grandkids or whatever, I'd suggest those. But if you don't have the budget for any of this stuff, I mean, I get it. We live in Trudeau's Canada here, and so things are tightening up. And, uh, and this is being recorded, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> ah, um, whatever, whatever. If you don't have the budget for any of this stuff, get the free stuff. You don't need to buy anything. I I'm serious. If you, if you can't afford it, don't buy it. But would you please go to that really complex website that we said when we started there? There's 15,000 articles for you to read. Costs you nothing. See, our heart as a ministry is to equip the church. And there's only so much I can do in, in like a Sunday morning service. I, I, I've zipped through some of these things to kind of whet your appetite in a sense. But there's so much more that we could talk about. Our, our, our time is up here. But go to the website. You could, or if you get a resource, the, the, the information will continue long term. And you can watch my TV show. We have hundreds of videos and, and the TV show. Actually, we were nominated for Best Christian TV Show last year. That was our fourth nomination. And I got the nod for Best Christian TV Show Host. And, and that, that was, I didn't win. It's just, just a nomination. The first time I was not, we've been nominated four times. The first time was in 2018. And that year I was up against Kirk Cameron. And he took it that year. And I thought, okay, all right. Well, well I'll let him have it. Sorry. <laughs> Anyways. We're, we're writing and shooting season nine. There's over 180 episodes online. See, we've ha we have something, even for those of you who don't like to read. <laughs> it, 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 pick, a, pick a topic you've never heard of before or something you, you're, you've always wondered about. Hit play and go make a bowl of popcorn. Sit there, listen to, listen to us talk about this stuff. So, uh, anyway, 
I can kind of talk about this for millions of years. But remember to hand in those, those forms after we close here. And can I close in prayer? Let me, let, me, let me just close in prayer. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for science. We thank you for scientists and some of the amazing studies that have been done, the, the amazing things that have been revealed about your creation, your amazing creation. And Lord, I just pray that if, if the folks here have struggle with some of this uh, or, or have kids or grandkids that struggle with some of these topics, I pray that you'd guide them to a resource or something on the website or, or, or one of the episodes of the TV show that, that might help them work through those issues, those doubts, and cause their faith to grow. And more than that, Lord, I pray that the folks here would use some of this information, sharing it with people who don't believe that your word is true. And as a result of those efforts, we pray that many would come to know your son, Jesus, for it's in his name we pray. Amen.